Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am uh, Tom Stafford, Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of Sheffield. And I'm very pleased to be chairing this uh, afternoon of uh, presentations and discussions. Uh, we're going to have a series of presentations and then we'll go to a panel discussion to uh, close between 2.30 and 3. And then we'll have an opportunity to hear more from uh, uh, our audience guests and uh, our speakers maybe we'll have questions for each other. Um, uh, uh, this is a joint UKRN and uh, Rory uh, event. The UKRN is a um, uh, network launched in 2019. Uh, I'm very fond of the tagline on the website um, with the aim. The aim of the UKRN is for the UK research system to be outstanding in conducting and promoting rigorous and transparent research. The UKRN is part of a growing uh, national and international network of institutions uh, committed to that goal. Uh, one current piece of work is our open research program, uh, which focuses on sort of raising the standard of engagement, research engagement with open research practices uh, via training, uh, focused on recognition reward, institutional sharing and meta research. I will put the link for the program uh, updates, which Neil Jacobs sends out he sent out one just an hour ago um i'll put that in the chat uh the meeting's being recorded you can look at other ukrn uh videos uh from events via the youtube channel i'll put that in the chat as well um uh, so i'm very happy to be associated with the ukrn and i'm probably chair because i'm also associated with rory the research on research institute uh which um uh, uh is an institute which brings together people and organizations that care about research, gathering information and developing tools to inform and improve how research is funded, practiced, communicated and evaluated. Uh, what, uh, lots of uh, activity around Rory, but one activity um, in particular leaps out, which is at 3 p.m. today. There is a live event at UCL, which you can also join online if you are not fatigued, if you are excited rather by this event. Um, the event is Invert the Order, Government's Role in Shaping a Science Superpower uh, with James Phillips, who is Science and Technology Special Advisor to the Prime Minister. I'll put the link for that in the chat. So with those notes, let's crack on with um, uh, the programme for today, which is obviously about um, the future of peer review. Uh, last Wednesday, the Science and Innovation and Technology Committee report on reproducibility and research integrity was published, and they noted these two sentences in their section on peer review, which I pulled out. Um, peer review is a vital tool for ensuring the accuracy and integrity of research that is published. And then the paragraph below, academics increasingly do not have time to extensively scrutinize others' work on top of that numerous additional priorities and it can therefore also be hard for journals to find expert reviewers that's probably an open secret among researchers so without foreshadowing what our speakers um, are going to talk about today that's some of the context uh, I'd like to introduce Dr Helen Buckley Woods who is our first speaker postdoctoral researcher at the Research and Research Institute thank you so I'm going to talk to you about um, a framing for this session, which is um, about four schools of thought on how to improve scientific peer review. Um, so this is a paper, um, and if you want to read the full paper, it's published on Learned Publishing. It was the brainchild of Professor Ludo Waltman. He came up with the, uh, the initial idea. Um, and it was part of the idea came from um, a whole uh, program of work that we did, which was a pilot project, one of Rory's pilot projects. Um, and at the start of Rory, the Research and Research Institute, innovation in peer review was identified as one of the key challenges in the scholarly communication system. Um, all Rory's projects are co-produced. So we worked with uh, many colleagues in the um, academic publishing and scholarly publishing uh, fields. Um, and we did uh, a number of projects. So the main thing we did was um, uh, this project's whole uh, experiments in peer review. Um, so this is where we survey different innovations in peer review. Um, so in that, in that project, um, we had 
95 different types of innovations or self-defined innovations in peer review and 54 respondents to our survey with various types of people coming forward, publishers, journal editors, peer review startups, various different groups and, and, and individuals. And then we created, created an inductive taxonomy of innovations. And if you want to read that paper, which was led by uh, Wolfgang Kaltenbrunner, then you can read that in the Journal of Documentation. Um, as part of that, um, that piece of work, there was a literature review, which I led, which is published on Welcome Open Research, where we, um, we reviewed the literature to look at existing innovations in peer review, um, what, what had been published about that, um, to see what examples there were, what broad types of innovation there were. Um, we, we landed on six reviews after reviewing the papers to see there were six, which then encapsulated all these different types of innovation. If you want to read that, that's also there as well. So um, the, what we found was that there's so many different types of innovation um, from so many different perspectives, um, from very various different professions that are in, involved in the research system. Um, and became clear they were so diverse, so many different actors, um, that it would be useful to um, think about them in four categories or in different categories. And then these are the these are the, the four schools. It didn't have to be four, but it it came, it emerged as four. So the quality and reproducibility school, the democracy and transparency school, the equity and inclusion school, and the efficiency and incentive school. These aren't rigid categories. Um, clearly, if someone was interested in um, um, review a burden and re peer review being more efficient, that doesn't mean to say they don't care about, you know, how the quality of the product, the quality of peer review clearly you know, most people would be interested in all of these things, but it's merely um, where someone might place their emphasis, where they might think this is the most um, important challenge or the place where we need to um, place most of our efforts in improving uh, peer review. So um, I'm going to briefly go through each of the different uh, schools and describe them um, and then other speakers will be going into more detail with uh, initiatives and um, their um, uh, perspectives and so on in, in, in these different areas. Um, so the quality and uh, reproducibility school, these are initiatives that are really interested in improving, improving the quality of peer review and the reliability of peer review. And they're also, it's also concerned with identifying scientific misconduct um, with the belief that review processes currently are not robust enough um, and that the quality and rig rig rigor of review must be increased to make better accept or reject decisions. Um, and a hallmark of that would be to see a high level of inter-reviewer agreement. So examples would be things like um, reviewer training, uh, this example of interventions or innovations, uh, reviewer training, use of reviewer checklists, um, you know, focus on um, research integrity, some registered reports where you could see a, a research plan reviewing research at the beginning of the process. Um, so these are all initiatives that are interested in the, the quality and the, the reproducibility of peer review. Democracy and transparency, these are initiatives um, interested in making evaluation accountable and open with the idea that traditional peer review is too secretive and it encourages gatekeep gatekeeping. Um, and this is about um, decentralizing the, the power in the, that gatekeeping role, in um, decentralizing it to make it not as, as focused on, um, on editors and what they do, um, bringing in you know, the wisdom of the crowd um, in trying to um, you know, decentralize that kind of you know, where, where those decisions are being taken. And also, um, observing that you know if that's already a problem then that's um, that's compounded by the fact that often peer review is secret so it's the idea of making it transparent and then also um decentralizing or diffusing about you know where these decisions are made equity and inclusion the equity and inclusion school is about making processes more equitable and diverse 
with the belief that peer review suffers from biases related to gender, geography, race, and so on. Um, and there's two key ideas here. One is about the need for a, a balanced representation of different groups of researchers in the peer review system, and also the need for um, a diversity of knowledge in the system. Um, so no one should be um, disallowed or not able to be part uh, participate in peer review because of who they are. And also different types of knowledge should be included. And we quoted this um, COPE report on um, diversity inclusion that refers to different types of knowledge. So knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance with the latter coming from experiencing the phenomenon personally. So it's the idea if you've only got a very specific group of people, um, maybe certain types of knowledge aren't gained through that gate, aren't gained through that filter because, you know, not everyone's, if, if, if there's certain knowledge that's only, a, a, you haven't experienced it, you're not going to recognise it, maybe that's not becoming part of the, uh, part of the um, scholarly literature. Example initiatives are um, perhaps setting targets or quotas um, to increase the diversity of reviewers and ed editorial board members, um, double blind peer review to hide author identity from reviewers. The efficiency and incentive school is a concerned with, it's about initiatives to streamline processes and to incentivize um, reviewers. So um, this is really concerned with um, reviewer fatigue and an over, overburdened system, concerned about pressure on peer review um, and the idea about needing to increase efficiency in the peer review system and make um, also make this peer review work um, uh, to, to, to make that more open. So it's not hidden work so that um, people are recognised for the work they've done. And, and it's also about decoupling peer review from the journals or from the publishing process. So, um, so you have things like portable peer review where um, say there was a publisher had a suite of journals, if one article didn't fit with one journal, but the review had already been done, maybe it's suitable for another journal and the review goes with them. You don't need to do the reviewing all over again. Um, and then journal independent peer review. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a totally separate, you know, separate from the uh, publishing process. So, um, as I said, it's, um, you know, there are complementarities between the school. People are interested in one, one school, they're, they're probably interested in the others, but they're perhaps putting more emphasis on one here, on one school. But there's also tensions between the schools. So, for example, the, the quality and reprodu reproducibility school aims for more rigorous filtering and scrutiny and so on. Um, democracy and transparency schools, I said, questions the emphasis put on this kind of um, binary accept, reject decisions. That's the school that's thinking about um, uh, decentralizing the, the sort of decision making process and so on. Um, quality and reproducibility are assuming specific notions for quality, perhaps. Perhaps there's a tension there with the equity and inclusion school who are thinking more about diversity. Uh, of authors and types of research. Quality and reproducibility school may cause um, the amount of review work to increase, perhaps it's greater scrutiny, more steps in the process. The efficiency and incentive school aims to reduce pressure on the peer review system. So there's probably a tension there between the, um, you know, the quality and the rigor of review and how much pressure that's gonna put on people. So, um, one point on that to conclude is that um, conversations between the schools are useful um, in order to, to look at creative ways to deal with these tensions. There's also room for um, more heterogeneity in the peer review system. So, you know, different coexistence of different types of review, uh, different forms of peer review. Um, for example, um, you know, a basic quality assurance followed by post-publication peer review could sit alongside um, in-depth rigorous peer review for certain research outputs. Um, also, there's the idea that we need to, um, you know, clearly peer review is not only in um, scholarly publishing, 
doing it's in other aspects of the research system and um, there are initiatives going on to develop peer review and, and improve peer review across the research system so we don't want something that's happening in scholarly publishing to unwittingly scupper um, an innovation that's going on in some other part of the research system so it's the idea of um, working in the, obviously in your own field of expertise but having those links with them um, across the board to to others and who are doing trying to do something similar so that we can uh, work together okay that's the uh, close of my presentation i'll hand back to you tom thank you very much helen we are going to press on with our next speaker please save up your questions for the panel discussion uh, in a bit or put them into the chat. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Emily Chanette, who's Editor-in-Chief at PLOS One. Hello, it's morning for me and afternoon for most of the rest of you, I imagine. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and for your attention and your enthusiasm for joining this panel. It's really a pleasure to, to be here, to be able to talk about uh, quality and reproducibility and um, how open research kind of is, is brought to bear on these. So um, this is the cover of The Economist from uh, 10 years ago now uh, about you know, how science goes wrong. So I think we all can accept that peer review has a role in safeguarding the integrity of the research, but peer review is imperfect, right? As, as Helen just mentioned in her talk, there's a lot of tension between different schools of, of peer review. Um, as Tom mentioned too, the, the pool of reviewers is exhausted and people generally are exhausted, right, after years of stress related to the pandemic and all of these other uh, responsibilities that, that fall on active researchers' plates. And so, you know, there are longstanding concerns about fraud in scientific research, right, that, that is linked to the integrity of the review process. And so I've just pulled out a couple of headline um, articles here dating back from 20, 2005. And I wanted to kind of bring particular attention to this one at the bottom here and up this recent science news story about you know, the, the um, apparent commonality of fake papers. And this is on a preprint that was posted on BioArchive. I, I think it was BioArchive. And there's been a really robust discussion on the methodology of the preprint. And so I don't consider this a, a settled issue. But the authors in kind of discussing some of these comments, the authors of the preprint have pointed out that even if their, their assumptions are off by an order of magnitude, it's still a very large number of papers that could be potentially fraudulent or fake that are in the published literature. So what I wanna to talk today, talk about today is about open research and, and how potentially open research can address issues around quality and reproducibility in science. But let's first address what I mean by quality. So, you know, working at PLOS, we, we have kind of three main indicators of, of what we think represent high quality published research. And these are integrity, rigor, and the degree of openness, so open research. So by integrity, we mean that the research was conducted according to shared values and norms that are then call, codified by journals as policies. What I mean about is, is things around com conflict of interest, um, disclosures around interest, credit and attribution for authors, for reviewers, for editors, people involved in the process, and then also research ethics. Was the research conducted ethically? So we know that um, in, over the past you know, 20 years, the, the percent of disclosure has increased and journals are increasingly checking adherence to, to these policies around conflict of interest, disclosures, and also about funding sources. And so it's really gratifying to see that, you know, as these policies are being brought online and as more and more attention is, is, is shown on the potential complication around undisclosed COIs, we're actually seeing a degree, a better degree of adherence. So this is from a PLOS bio paper that was published about two years ago. We also, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, integrity for integrity to really be meaningful, we need to make sure that the people who are involved in the in the writing and review process receive proper credit, and so that they are accountable for the, the research that they publish or the research that they review, but they also then receive credit for their contributions. And importantly, having this sort of open infrastructure around authorship and contribution can also allow us to detect plagiarism and then also track contrib contributions kind of throughout the, the research life cycle as well. And I've shown here a couple of examples of the technologies that, that we work with to address this point. And finally, talking about integrity, we have to talk about research ethics, obviously. 
So journals develop and enforce really robust ethics standards, and we're seeing again more and more of this. Um, I wanted to bring uh, attention to a, a recent policy change on PLOS One, where we are requiring that authors provide proof of their ethics approval at the time they submit their manuscript for any study that involves human participants. Um, other journals have also in place uh, new policies around large language models like chat GPT. Um, this is a science editorial that was recently published that's, that's strictly banning the use of AI tools like chat GPT as an author. Um, and so journals have a real key role here in developing and crucially enforcing these policies to ensure that the research that they publish is is has, has integrity, right? And then also that it's available for editors and reviewers to review during the review process and then for the community to see after review. So next I wanna talk about rigor. And, and I kind of wanna approach this in a, in a discipline specific way because different fields have different kind of standards of what they mean by rigor. And so things like experimental design, statistics, validation of reagents, this is kind of developing not in block by, but a little bit more field by field here. And so I'll like, give an example from the life sciences here. This is about, um, you know, how policies around, not policies, I should say, but, but how the, the norms around describing two different bits of really crucial experimental design have changed over the past couple of years. So you can see that the, the, the percent of studies that report randomization has increased to about 30, 35% over uh, 10, 20 years. But sample size calculation has been <laughs> remained constant at a very, very low portion of studies that are actually disclosing um, sample size. And you could argue that you know sample size calculations are incredibly important to make sure that the study is adequately powered and that you know you can actually draw reliable conclusions from from the results. And so it's interesting that there are these differences in, in the same field, but then also it's a very field specific effect too with the life sciences. And we also, as publishers, have, have joined up to enforce reporting standards here too that, that, that seek to improve the rigor of the research that we publish. Here's an example here, the MDAR framework that uh, several different publishers have, have signed up to. It's a reporting a framework and a checklist that authors can use to ensure that the research that they publish is reproducible, is conducted transparently. transparently. And so finally, the, the last kind of pillar of um, you know, the, the quality indicators that I mentioned is, is about open research. And so for us, open research is, is much more than open access. It's, it's an open way of doing this. So it is um, kind of the, an open research life cycle from the design of the um, study, you know, the, the protocols and things like that to publishing data sets and, and code as the study develops, um, sharing the preprints. And then also once the work is peer reviewed and published, publishing those peer review reports too, to give a full kind of view of all aspects of the, the research. And I also want to stress that it that also includes things like new article types and, and new um, initiatives like journal funder partnerships that focus on the research question and the quality of, of the work that was done rather than you know, how hot the findings are. So a couple of short examples here about um, how open research has changed. So I mentioned responsible data sharing is a pillar of open research. And we've published a couple of studies that show that the data sharing is associated with an increase in citation rates. It's, it's just a correlation. It's not you know, a cause and effect relationship, but there is a, a correlation there. And uh, work on PLOS's open science indicators that have been published and, and updated show that there is a steady, slow, but steady increase in the amount of data sharing in PLOS journals, which is the solid red line compared to competitors. Um, PLOS journals have a slightly higher rate of data sharing. We have a policy that mandates it um, and, and not all other competitor journals do. When we look at access to code, we see a kind of similar story. There's been a slow but steady increase in the amount of code that has been shared in PLOS journals, you know, compared to competitor journals. But strikingly, when you in actually put a code sharing policy, a mandate in place, which is this bottom graph with the blue line, you see an increase in the amount of code that is shared by authors. And so that dotted line, that dotted uh, vertical line is when the policy was implemented, understanding that it can take, you know, three, six, nine months for paper to be submitted and work through peer review, you start to see that, that kind of increase um, you know, in the quarters that follow. And, you know, if you look on the, on the vertical axis too, you can see that the compliance in, in PLOS Comp Bio is actually quite high where, you know, up to now it's getting up close to 90% of papers have the code that's, that's shared. And we ran a small survey with, with authors of PLOS Comp Bio and found that, 
you know, you can read, read these points that 70% um, of them access the code to aid their understanding. Um, but 21% of them, which is not an insignificant number, access the code to assess the quality of the research. And so open research really is an important indicator of quality as well. And finally, the last kind of bit of data that I wanted to share here was about preprint sharing. And so similar, this, this, the graphs on the red are from the open science indicators. <laughs> and you can see that the proportion of preprints that have been shared has, has increased. And we know that the COVID pandemic um, kind of was a, a step change in attitudes around preprint sharing, um, in, especially in the health sciences fields um, where we saw more more and more preprints being shared. This is specific to um, data on bioarchive, not, not including MedArchive or the other uh, preprint service that we have relationships with. But you can see that you know, there, there is an increased uh, acceptance of, of preprints, um, both at, at PLOS and then also in competitors. But importantly, there are kind of big differences here around disciplines and then also in geographic areas too, where you can see that the percent of articles with a preprint from authors in the Americas and Europe is higher than the percent of manuscripts with a preprint from authors in Africa and the Middle East, for example, or in Asia. So to wrap up, I, I wanna make the point that when we talk about quality and reproducibility, we're actually really talking about open research and, and open research really enables reviewers, editors, and readers to access and to assess policy, compli policy compliance, um, you know, the experimental design, reagents, reporting, data at all stages of the research life cycle. And so this transparent sharing of the research outputs in a transparent manner supports trust in research. So what, what role do journals have in, in driving quality and reproducibility during review? So this uh, report was just mentioned too. Um, so instead of focusing on the peer review side of things, I went straight down to what, what, what do journals need to do? And I pulled out the bullet points that are at the, the summary of this report. I just kind of wanted to, to go through these. So they're encouraging um, journals to engage with researchers. And I really love this idea that it's a, it's a collective responsibility here to employ these fair principles um, within the research that, that governs, um, that sets up rules for accessibility and, and reuse. Um, they also suggest, which you know, Pulse journals already do, that journals should mandate deposition of research data. Um, suggesting that journals review por their portfolios or publishers review their portfolios ensure that there's an outlet for negative and confirmatory science. Um, that calling out publishers to be much more responsive in publication of corrections to the scientific literature, which that's that's a more con con contentious issue, right? Because it takes some time to make sure that we're you know doing the the right thing, making the right decision. But I agree that much more transparency around here is needed to ensure that we can move quickly as a field. And then also using technology to support the quality of the published uh, record. So specifically, then, what 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 are what are we going to do to address these questions? And I think the the points that were laid out in the report are a really good starting point. Some of which we already do, and some that we clearly need to do a little bit uh, more to to ensure that we're really you know meeting them to the to the full extent. Um, but what I'd like to do is to ensure that we are actively partnering with the research community to understand and to resolve barriers to open research and that we develop policies that, that actually check for adherence. And you know, this is a huge human cost in, in this, right? And, and in a drive for, you know, Helen mentioned these tensions between the different schools of peer review and in a drive for an efficient workflow, you know, having a human check all of these policies adds time to the review and adds, you know, staff to the to the editorial office. So we should definitely be looking for opportunities for automation in this as well to ensure that we have policy compliance in a very easy, straightforward way for authors. But also using um, automation and, and, you know, things like bringing ethics statements to, to the forefront can also support editors and reviewers during review to make sure that their work is focused on like the, the crucial elements of the story, you know, the statistical analysis, for example, or um, you know, reagents or, or things that the journal decide is important. And finally, I just want to make a make a, a call for focusing on the research question and the experimental design 
and the, you know, the, the quality of how that's done as the study progresses and not the interest in the conclusions. And so this will involve things like um, supporting pre-registration of research and ensuring that we have outlets for null and confirmatory research. Oops. So overall, how can we support quality and reproducibility during review? And I would argue that transparency is key. Transparency for editors, for reviewers, to enable them to understand how the study was conducted and, and really be able to, to do that full and thorough review of the work. For readers to be able to understand, you know, make sure that they, they, they draw appropriate conclusions from the data set, um, to build on the, the research in their own work. And then for the community, you know, as an open access journal, we all of the research that we publish is, is publicly available. And it's really important that you know people who are accessing the research can, can have the full picture, including all of the data, the protocols, and everything that went into that. And finally, I just want to end on this quote here um, that you know, without transparency, claims only achieve credibility based on trust, and transparency is superior to trust. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emily, for that excellent talk. So many important and interesting topics. Uh, please. Uh, save up the questions for Emily for later and give her special thanks for rising earlier in the day than any other of our panelists. We must press on uh, Dr. Rebecca Lawrence, Managing Director of F1000. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to what I think uh, is an increasingly important discussion, actually. Um, and thank you to Emily for setting me up so well uh, with a lot of things that she just talked to. Uh, so I was asked to talk about the, and really sort of delve in a little bit more around the democracy and transparency side of peer review and open peer review and, and post allocation uh, review. Um, so very brief background just um, in terms of understanding who we are and where we're coming from. Um, so F1000's focus and approach has been very much on an open research approach to publishing and focusing on peer reviewing post-publication um, using a, a completely transparent and invited peer review model, um, using uh, a requirement for fair and open research data and code and materials and other elements that we just talked about, and obviously having full open access. Uh, and we have our range of, of titles that we run ourselves, but also partnering with other parts of the community to really try to uh, enable um, implementation of some of the open research elements because as publishers it's very difficult to do this on your own so partnering particularly with funders and institutions and societies and that's examples there. Obviously working as part of Taylor and Francis group now um, and you know, Dora you know, underpins a lot of what we do and how we think about peer review and, and as Emily was just saying around the yeah, real we'll focus on the peer review looking at the soundness uh, of the research as opposed to um, the sort of potential impact and separating uh, those two aspects. So why did we sort of go down that sort of post-publication um, peer review approach and, and why do I think that's got real you know, benefits and advantages? So obviously this is very similar to the advantages that preprints in themselves have around as I say, separating the, the issues around visibility and publication, whatever we want to call it, and it's where terminology gets confusing, but getting the, the research out there and separating that from the assessment of quality and potential for impact, what it might mean, what it might not mean, and um, really um, enabling, therefore, and encouraging, in fact, the ability for researchers to share what they want, when they want, um, which therefore means it's much easier to share negative and null findings, confirmatory or uh, non-confirmatory reports, incremental findings, all of those sort of things um, that can traditionally be much harder to get formally published, um, but actually are so important to balancing our understanding of uh, scientific advancement and uh, the literature more generally and supporting therefore reproducibility. Also, obviously, removes delay in access to new discoveries. Uh, and obviously, this is why we saw those big spikes around COVID. But, you know, in the, the um, environment that we're all living through at the moment, it's really critical in so many fields now that we are able to get new information out really quickly so that people can start to analyze it and build on it whilst the peer review process is going on. 
uh, without having to wait for that. The other thing is around really opening up that input and that critique and that discussion to a much, much broader group of people much more quickly. Um, and it also, I think, changes the nature of what the peer review is about because it, it moves it away from that um, decision around do we or don't we publish it? Because it's already out there, it's already published, it's already communicated. So it really shifts it to what peer review is really meant to be about and uh, what I think we're all trying to get it to be about, which is about improving the quality of, of work and supporting and working with the authors um, to get that work to a better place. So the transparent peer review that we do use as open identities, and there's a lot of open discussion about should we or shouldn't we have open identities, and in fact most uh, publishers I think that have used open peer review to date don't use open identities. I would argue open identities are actually I think are pretty critical to this. Um, so this is where the reviewers provide their name and affiliation and it's published alongside the article. So it means you can see who they are and what um, and why they might have said what they said. Um, we've talked a little bit about conflicts of interest, but I think the open declaration of the conflicts of those viewers is really critical to this. And in fact, it allows a broader group potentially to peer review um, because there are some communities where you know the research is done by such a large collective, it's very hard to find somebody that has no conflict whatsoever. And by being clear what that potential conflict might be, then you can, you know, as a reader, make your own inferences to, to what influence that may or may not have had. And also, as was referenced at the beginning, you know, capturing ORCID IDs and having, you know, understanding who the individual is, as well as being able to provide credit back to them, uh, is really important. And so we certainly focus uh, a lot of attention on and encouraging, in fact, requiring at least one reviewer to have shared their ORCID ID. Um, the other thing about then having the open reports is that the report is published alongside the article and it enables co-reviewing. And so we get a lot of reviewers where their more junior colleagues who are often are the ones that have actually done the review can get the credit for doing the review. Uh, and we uh, encourage them to co-sign those review reports and then to make the reviews citable by being able to add a DOI um, and being able to track metrics around those as well. So they become an important object in their own right beyond simply being attached to the paper. And then the further step is around providing an open review status so that the reviewers uh, provide uh, some at a glance information about what their overarching view is uh, on that, uh, on that uh, article, uh, which then affects the need to have an editor making a decision uh, based uh, on their viewpoint and their potential bias on, on a sort of summary of, of whether that passes peer review. So it, it helps to negate the need for that. So I think some of the key benefits around transparent peer review are really about making reviewers much more accountable for what it is that they say. If they're named uh, on there, this is why I think the naming is so clear. Uh, it means that reviewers aren't overly positive uh, uh, beyond what they should be on the on the article because you know it's clearly visible to everybody but equally they're not overly negative uh, or critical about a piece of work because again it's clear for everyone um talked about the visibility on the conflicts and the, and the credit the other side and this is where i think there is a real blurring you know around those sort of four schools of, of thought around peer view i think there's a real blurring between between many of them in fact i think we we kind of want to sunk, find somewhere in the middle uh, around all of those issues, because I think actually this helps to democratise peer review um, and helps to address some of the influence around geography and lab prestige, uh, et cetera. So we work, for example, um, with uh, the uh, uh, for Africa Foundation and um, one of the reasons why they wanted to work with a completely transparent model was because they wanted to ensure that it removed that bias as to where the researchers were from and in terms of as, as authors and be treated fairly. Uh, and again, I think that's where it's really important that it's full transparency um, that you, you have on the, the reviewer names. Uh, equally the same with uh, lab prestige, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's quite, it's quite a bit of evidence that suggests that improves peer review quality, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. Um, but again, 
you can the readers can see the quality of the peer review report and so it makes you more responsible about what it is that you write um, and also helps to tackle issues around predatory publishing because it's very clear whether something has been peer reviewed or not um, and how rigorous it's been reviewed and by whom so I think there's a real benefit uh, from that perspective. It also opens up more of that discussion so it enables authors to respond directly to the viewer, tackle misconceptions. You didn't understand that. Um, uh, that's not what, what I was trying to say here, or et cetera. And discuss and debate issues, which is really what science should be about. And I think also for the readers, there's a really valuable um, perspective and context that the reviews provide. Um, where you get to see differing views. And this is where I think actually forcing it into one, you know, combined viewpoint uh, as to whether this article is right or wrong often isn't the case it isn't possible I don't think you know there often are sometimes quite strong views different views in research about a piece of work and I think it's important to recognize those and understand what those views are and obviously visibility on the reviews uh, enables that one of the interesting consequences though is that it opens a lid on peer review uh, in a way that I think people don't sort of necessarily think about. So, I mean, it's quite interesting that it shows the weaknesses and the problems that most researchers are not aware of. Uh, and we actually find that the, the, the peer review reports that come in, we do a lot of checks on those. We make sure they're appropriate, that they're thorough, and I'll put up here, yeah, we'll go through them, but some more things that we look at. But we send back probably about 40% of the peer review reports that come in because they are not thorough enough, they're not appropriate enough. And actually, you know, this is what goes on behind the scenes when it's closed and nobody's aware. Um, but it's all there for everyone to see. So you often get questions about, you know, why is that not more rigorous? Well, actually, that is what happens normally. Uh, and I think there's some real benefits to that and to really exposing what happens uh, behind the scenes and then figuring out um, what we do about it. And I think Sorry, on that point, I think there's a real um, requirement actually around training of researchers as to how to good peer review, because often they're only exposed to the small subset of peer review reports that they receive, unless they happen to be a journal editor. And so there isn't real training about how to do good peer review. Also, peer review, I think you know, it's just one form of validation and it's not going to solve everything. You know, it's a small number of people. It's two or three people who are looking at this. Um, and I think we probably expect too much of peer review and think that it's going to catch everything. Often reviewers are not experts in integrity and, and sometimes even in re reproducibility issues, depending on what the issue is. Um, and so I think we need to think much more broadly about the different types of validation that we need and recognize um, more some of the other types of validation that need to be done that many journals do and but everybody does to different levels preprints and journals all do different levels of checks and um, we do actually quite rigorous checks prior to publication it removes probably about 50 percent of what comes in in the first place it's quite a large percentage um, that gets kicked out through that and you know there's a whole suite of different things that we need i think we need to recognize some of those checks which really do help particularly around the integrity side as you know at least as important actually as peer review which is a different type of assessment compared to community assessment which is a further type and i think we need to to not put everything right behind peer review and assume that's going to solve all of it and on that i think there's a need for us all to work together on transparency of what checks have and have not been done um and whether something has passed those checks and indeed what type of peer review has been conducted because it's increasingly hard for readers to understand with the plethora of different models and approaches how much trust should i actually put in this and what has actually been checked and what hasn't by whom um and so i think there's a there's uh, something that we need to do together as a community to get some consistency about how we show that and then finally, I think there's just a couple of other things that we need to, to consider and they will be, uh, they've already been touched upon or will be touched upon uh, later. The first is about publishing earlier in the research process uh, and providing feedback more regularly throughout uh, the process. Obviously, uh, Chris will be talking about registered reports uh, shortly, so I won't go into that. But uh, yeah, there's a whole range of different types of outputs throughout the process that I think are really important to give us a much broader sense as to um, 
the research that's been done um, and will support us actually in terms of understanding uh, the validation and trust that, uh, that we can put behind that. Having open data and materials will make it much harder for, to fabricate data. It's not impossible, but it's, it certainly raises the barrier um, and it means that issues are more likely to be noticed. Again, if you have it transparently, then the whole community can look at it because the peer reviewers typically won't always have the time to look at that in detail. And then finally, I think we need to think more broadly about the range of different types of peer review types. You know, at the moment in general, we're all trying to get the same sort of type of peer review is to peer review everything and obviously we've got burgeoning range of outputs being published and as was touched on right at the beginning an increasingly peer review burden problem and actually a lot of those smaller incremental studies don't need you know such heavy duty peer review um they probably need something quite quick and simple um they don't need such senior researchers reviewing them but equally if we're going to sh to show and, and make those reviews transparent we need recognition that they don't need to be massive long peer review reports maybe they can be quite short and structured and so I think by doing that we could collectively help to address uh, the peer review burden problem that we all have and I will leave it there thank you very much thank you so much Rebecca um excellent our next speaker is Kim Eggleton head of peer review and research integrity at IOP publishing. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here and hi to everyone that's joined us online. Um, I'm having a real geek fest today. This has been brilliant listening to the other speakers. I'm a peer review um, geek, self-confessed. Um, so I am representing IOP Publishing. I'm the head of peer review and research integrity. We are a society-based publisher um, specialising in physics. Uh, we, we are part of the Institute of Physics and we have about 90 journals um, about half of which are proprietary, the other half we publish on behalf of other partners or societies. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about with you today is that school of thought, as Helen so brilliantly set up for us, um, around diversity and equity in peer review and to what extent can we make peer review more equitable. Um, and to set the scene for those of you that aren't in physics or the kind of STM hard sciences, a single anonymous or single blind, as it would used to be known, um, is the standard. So the authors don't know um, who the reviewers are and the reviewers do know who the authors are. Um, and this is what we typically seem to find in scholarly publishing um, under that single blind or single anonymous mechanism is that once you leave people out of a part of the cycle, there is a knock on effect in the rest of the parts of the cycle and you end up with some groups being continuously disadvantaged and this particular paper um, from 2017 was specifically talking about gender but there's certainly evidence in the literature to suggest that that applies also um, in issues of geography of race um, all sorts of different characteristics career stage age and so on um, now from our experience looking in the single anonymous realm there is definitely some very obvious bias going on and there are some examples here of quotes not just from IOP um thankfully I'm sure every publisher gets this kind of stuff thankfully very rarely um but some others from studies that have that have looked at this kind of bias um and and this is the reality and it was really interesting Rebecca to hear you say that you rescind a number of reports um and even under the the kind of non-open system we also rescind a, a probably a smaller proportion of reports but sometimes for this kind of stuff so there there is definitely some very real bias going on in the peer review process there's also quite a lot of unconscious bias we think going on and there's a number of studies here um which I'll let people read at their own pace um but that suggests that various different demographics has an impact on whether the work is most likely to be accepted or not and interestingly the demographics of the gatekeepers so the people doing the peer review those people on the editorial boards that also makes quite a difference in the outcome for some authors and some authors more than other more than others as well which is increasingly interesting um so we had a look at this starting around 2018 um, and looked at our current data. We didn't collect gender data at this time, so this was assumed gender using kind of AI. Um, but this is what roughly we were looking at. There was a high proportion of men being accepted than women. Um, and we were seeing some interesting geographical 
um, statistics as well, which are probably not that unusual for other publishing companies. A huge proportion of um, submissions coming out of China, but a significantly smaller proportion of our accepted work coming out of China and the opposite going on for the US, just as an example of, of two large countries. Um, so, for example, if you're a, a man working in the States, you've got a much better chance of being accepted than, say, a female working in China. So that was our position in 2018. And we kind of thought, right, this isn't good enough. What are we going to do about it? Um, and so we decided to experiment with double anonymous um, for a number of reasons that that established bias um, that we that we've seen both in the literature and from our own data. We looked outside of publishing um, at um, industries like recruitment, for example, where there's already some established work gone on to, to prove. And we all kind of assume now that, yeah, it's right that names should be taken off CVs and so on. So there's a, there's a school of thought that already agrees anonymization can be one of some useful tools to combat bias. Um, Double anonymous is really common in other disciplines. Personally, I'm from a social sciences background. I worked at a social sciences publisher for a long time. Um, double anonymous was the norm. I actually felt slightly uncomfortable when I started working in STM publishing. It's like, why, why do you need to know who wrote this and where they're based? It's not relevant to whether this works decent or not. Um, so, so we know double anonymous can work perhaps in other disciplines, but it can work. And what we were finding as well, there, were, there was a growing demand from our authors and our reviewers actually, to say, you know what, this I, I'd really rather participate in this kind of way. And so we wanted to provide a venue for people to be able to do that. Um, so we, alongside starting Double Anonymous, what we also wanted to do was improve our reporting because we wanted to be able to prove the efficacy or non-efficacy of what we were about to do. So since 2018, we've been collecting self-declared gender data. Um, we also collect data on career stage and geography, which we've been doing for much longer, um, just to give us some rigor and some reliability in the data that we're using. And we report that um, publicly, externally, obviously not down to the, the detail of, you know, which paper was written by who, but um, at, a, at a much broader journal or, or even higher level. Um, and the logistics of how we operate now at IOPP is that we allow our authors to effectively choose whether they want to go down a single anonymous route or a double anonymous route. There are some very strong views in the community about both methods. Um, so we didn't want to force any authors down a particular route they wouldn't feel comfortable with. For us, it was about author choice. Um, and we don't question what an author has chosen. That's, that's their right, that's their prerogative. So all our proprietary journals were converted to this method on uh, during 2021. Um, and some of our partner society titles have also opted into that since. And whenever we launch a new journal, that's automatically run on the same workflow now. And so the really exciting bit is, well, what difference does it make? Um, what we're seeing in terms of author behavior is that there is definitely a pattern of demographics who prefer double anonymous. Um, so you can see, for example, those you might consider to be in the minority, certainly in physics, which would be non-male authors definitely have a preference for, um, for double anonymous. And then you can also see from a geographical aspect where the preferences are. Now, this is a real surprise to me because I would have assumed that countries that were underrepresented in published output would have favoured double anonymous. That's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is a higher proportion of double anonymous from countries that actually were doing OK anyway. Um, so they, we wouldn't have expected those authors to be experiencing or perceiving that they were experiencing bias. And yet authors from countries who we might have perceived to be experiencing bias are not particularly engaged with the double anonymous method, um, which I think is really fascinating and, and worthy of a bit more research. Um, alongside collecting data on just who chooses what, we also get our authors and our reviewers to feedback whenever a manuscript reaches final decision stage. Um, and so they rate the peer review on timeliness, quality, transparency, and fairness. And you can see this is all the data today is from 2022 as a, as a whole. Um, you can see that our double anonymous authors consistently rate their experiences higher in all four aspects that we query them on compared to our single anonymous authors. And interestingly, 
our reviewers do exactly the same. Now we only ask them about two um, two of those facets, but again, those all those reviewers that are participating under the double anonymous system, again, are rating transparency and fairness more high than our single anonymous reviewers are. Um, one thing we we when we read a lot of the literature, there was definite arguments against double anonymous for the reason that reviewers would know who the authors were anyway. Some of our research fields are so small, and especially in the era of preprints, you can go and find out who the author is. If you're really motivated, you can go and find out. And so we wanted to find out whether that was true or not. And so part of our reviewer survey that we do, um, again, when any manuscripts reached a final decision is ask them if the manuscript was anonymized, did they, would they feel comfortable in trying to guess who the author might be? Would they like to share that guess? Um, and we can then validate, not, not to them, but internally, whether they that guess was accurate or not. Um, and interestingly, like 85% of reviewers say they, they couldn't or wouldn't want to guess. Um, and only 7% of reviewers admitted that they actually tr made an attempt to try and find out who the who the authors were. Now that's self-reported data. There, there may not be some truthful people answering that survey, but um, I, I personally felt really reassured when we got that data. And the other thing that we were certainly hearing from some of our um, publishing colleagues in other firms was that it's harder to get reviewers under a double anonymous method. People want to know who the authors are, and actually they might not even accept the invitation to review if they don't know who the author is, because they don't want to waste their time reviewing work, um, that they can't kind of make a assumption before they've read it about how good it might be, which proves a whole point anyway, right? Um, and interestingly, this is our data just from the last 12 months. Um, you can see it really moves around. There, Right now, there is a trend to say that, um, I should say that the blue line is um, single anonymous and the orange line is double anonymous. Um, Right now, it's easier for us to find reviewers for single anonymous, but that wasn't the case last summer at all. Um, so it really moves around and it's quite it's quite difficult to predict how that trend might continue. Um, so the other really, really fascinating thing, and this is the question I get asked most of all is, but what difference does it actually make to output? What proportion of work is getting accepted and isn't getting accepted um, under each method? So this again is 2022, the full year. And we can see across our entire portfolio where journals offer this option, you are more likely to be accepted under the double anonymous method than you are under the single anonymous method, which, nobody thought would happen both internally and externally when we were talking to people about what we were about to do and what difference does it make firstly by gender well you can see here that if you're um, a male you've yes you've still got more chance of being accepted under a double anonymous um, but you've you've got less chance of being accepted than a female has and yet it's the opposite under single single anonymous so from a gender perspective there's potentially some evidence starting to come out of this that women may be um, better served under the double anonymous method and that suggests that maybe they are experiencing that bias that we think we've read about in the literature. Um, I should just say before I move on actually there wasn't enough there isn't enough data yet on non-binary authors that have had work accepted to be able to share any statistics there but as soon as the volume of data is significant enough then obviously we will share that. Um, and finally, just to um, touch on the impact that this is having from a geographical perspective, um, again, the vast majority of regions here are, are experiencing better outcomes under double anonymous versus single. But what I want to point out, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but is look at that rate for Africa. You have more than double the chance of being accepted under the double anonymous method if you're if you're based in Africa. Um, not quite to the same extreme, but Asia, Middle East, there's really quite a marked difference. In fact, the only regions that are benefiting from the single anonymous method, interestingly, is Eastern Europe, the UK and Western Europe. Um, and for physics, that's potentially not much of a surprise given the location of some of the biggest physics researching groups like CERN and so on. Um, so I find that absolutely fascinating and that it to me it really starts to build that that reliable evidence base to say that double anonymous is a way of combating bias in peer review. 
Um, and just to take the take the discussion to a slightly higher level, and as Helen rightly pointed out, because you favour one school of thought doesn't mean you ignore the others. Um, and that's absolutely what we're trying to do at IOP. And actually, I can think of examples from each of those schools where we're making changes to try and improve things. And what we think we found is that sweet spot of objectivity and rigour in the peer review process by using double anonymous and also investing in reviewer uh, training and research integrity screening as well in the house. But then combining that with the transparency that Rebecca's just talked about at publication. So making sure that all our work has open data behind it that's published at, you know, with alongside the article um, and that we offer a transparent peer review service as well with the choice for reviewers, whether they want to be anonymous or not. Um, but ideally, we want our work to be going through that rigorous double anonymous peer review method, but then published with the full transparency. So as a reader, you can really see the provenance and the journey that that article's been on with the data to back up some of the findings in the work. Um, so this is just an example of what transparent peer review looks like for us on the right hand side. You can click through to see the, um, the reviewer reports that go alongside an article. Um, so what's next for us? We are sharing our findings in sessions like this, but also um, we're working on a preprint at the moment. Um, and we're also exploring some tech to make this easier for authors. We are finding in a small proportion of authors that they intended to make the work double anonymous, but accidentally left some identifying information in the manuscript. Um, and because we don't question authors, we, you know, we, we let them take that as their own risk. We're investigating whether we can do something to automate that for authors to say, you know, would you like us to take that kind of information out for you? Um, and then the obvious question again that I always get asked in these sessions is, well, double anonymous is great, clearly works. When are you going to do triple anonymous? Which is for anyone that doesn't know is when your, your editors um, also don't know the identity of the authors. And it's something I I think about really regularly, the thing that's stopping us at the moment is probably technological infrastructure rather than desire, um, but we are making some cautious inroads into looking at what that might look like. Um, yeah, anyone wanting to find out more, there's a link and my email and you can always bother me on Twitter. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim. So much uh, to talk about. Um, and perhaps if you want to put those contact details in the chat for people who didn't catch them, that'd be great. We're going to press on Chris uh, Chambers, Professor Chris Chambers from the University of Cardiff and UKRN steering group member is presenting next. He has promised that he has a 10 minute presentation which will put us back on time for our break. Um, take it away, Chris. Thank you, Tom. I hope you can hear me. Yep. So great. Uh, so we've heard lots of very interesting uh, perspectives on peer review. And I'm going to talk today about uh, doing peer review independent of journals altogether. And I think to frame this, it's, it's for a moment, it's worth reflecting on a bit of history. It's kind of an, an artifact of history, an accident of history in a way that journals manage peer review because peer review is, of course, done by peers. It's done by the academic community primarily. Um, most of the editing is, in fact, done by academics as well. But journals tend to manage the peer review process. So today I'm going to talk about a prove an example of how we can take peer review uh, and separate it, divorce that from the publishing process and perform that peer review within the community to exactly the same high standard. And in particular, uh, combine it with the registered reports initiative to really maximize the utility of the review in the first place. So to unpack this, I'm gonna start by just uh, explaining registered reports for those of you who are not familiar with it. So as um, Helen mentioned and other speakers have mentioned, you know, touched on slightly, the registered reports article type is different to the regular type of research article that we're familiar with because uh, it incorporates peer review prior to the research being conducted. Uh, and then based upon um, an evaluation of theory, rationale, methodological rigor at that pre-study phase, the journal or platform that's um, coordinating the peer review issues an in-principle acceptance, which guarantees that if the authors comply with their study protocol, and report conclusions that are based upon the evidence that they have obtained, then the journal or platform will uh, publish the, uh, the outcomes regardless of how the results turn out. So the idea of registered reports is to eliminate from the peer review and publishing process, a range of common biases, uh, including publication bias against null or negative results, 
reporting bias by authors in which they might selectively report or include um, statistically significant or otherwise desirable findings in their papers, in many cases, in order to overcome the barriers that the system puts in place through publication bias in the first place. Um, and this initiative was launched about 10 years ago um, within the constructive journals and, and academic publishers, and it's been very successful. It's now in the mainstream. It's offered by over 350 journals. It's offered by Nature. It's expanding quickly across fields and areas. And you know, I don't want to go into detail here because I want to keep this really tight. But in, in a nutshell, um, it's popular with early career researchers. It's less likely to be prone to forms of bias that elevate our uh, impression of whether hypotheses are supported. The, the registered reports that have been published so far are more reproducible at a computational level. They're rated higher in quality and they're cited about the same. So all looking good on that front. It looks like registered reports are off to a good start. And you might think that's the end of it. But over the years, and I've been doing this for 10 years now, uh, I've noticed a number of limitations with the registered reports model. And they include, firstly, the stage one review time. So the time that it takes for researchers to go through that initial pre-study evaluation phase, it can last months. And this is time that um, is ultimately saved, I think, in the overall context of the review process, but which nevertheless can be problematic for people on short-term contracts and early career researchers. Secondly, of course, the standard model of registered reports involves submitting to one journal at a time, which is not terribly efficient when you think about the duplication of the review process that happens across many journals and publishers, and this adds to the uh, general overwork of everybody, and it also reduces the uh, options for authors. Uh, the format in its current state is poorly suited to programmatic research where, you know, authors might want to have one stage one protocol that includes multiple different arms that can produce different stage two outputs. But at the moment, every one of those two, 350 journals offers a model in which one stage one submission leads to one stage two submission. I've noticed also over the years, as more and more journals have adopted the format, an inconsistency in the editorial standards that are applied and in some cases quite poor quality editing, it goes on. And I think this is related to just variation in the levels of training and experience that are that are, uh, reflected in the community. And finally, um, the, the of course, if we restrict ourselves to registered reports controlled by largely commercial academic publishers, we're handing all of that value to profit in many cases. So all of the work that peer reviewers do for, for, for no pay, most of the work that academic editors do for very little money, only like, you know, small honor area, all of that process, all of that process that we're trading with ourselves is then owned by um, commercial academic publishers who turn over, you know, billions in profits at our expense. So can we think beyond this? And it's in an effort to solve these problems that we realized what we needed to do was combine registered reports with preprint evaluation using the existing peer community in initiative. So you may be familiar with peer community in, it's a it's a, a free, non-commercial, non-profit platform that, that performs and coordinates the review process at the preprint stage across all fields of research. Um, and uh, based upon those evaluations, uh, journals can then bid for publication if they'd like to you know, publish the article that arises from it, or they can uh, invite authors to submit for re-review and so on. So what we did is we created a peer community in, um, platform specific for registered reports. So now, before authors even go to a journal, they submit their stage one registered report to the peer community and registered reports initiative, where um, it's then evaluated in the same way it would be by journal, by experts in the field, and it's, and, and it's managed and coordinated by what we call a recommender, which is the equivalent of a journal editor. And our recommending team is made up of many of the original architects of the registered reports initiative itself. And then, um, we don't actually, we're not a journal, so we don't publish anything. We simply um, take the preprint that's already hosted. We then publish the peer reviews and a recommendation associated with that uh, preprint on the PCI Registered Reports website. And then we have, to cap it all off, we have a set of PCI Registered Reports friendly journals uh, that have committed to accepting uh, the recommendations of our platform without further peer review. So you can see here that we're not only have we created a journal independent review platform, but we've also allowed that to replace the peer review process that would have um, taken place, whether it was by journal. This is a schematic of how it works. Um, I'll, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. But broadly speaking, just as I've said, there's a stage one process where you get the evaluation of your preprint. It's then um, uh, after, in principle, acceptance, the study is conducted. And then at stage two, the reviewers come back and evaluate. And at the end, it's only at the end here, this point here, 
where um, journals are involved. This entire process takes place at a very high standard, completely separate from publishers and journals. Um, here's a list of our PCI registered reports friendly journals on the left, and in fact, F1000 is there, and others. Uh, and they cut across a broad range of fields, primarily, I suppose, beginning in psychology and neuroscience, which reflects the origins of registered reports. But we're increasing this list on the left here all the time. And so all of these journals commit to accepting the recommendations of the peer community in registered reports initiative um, without further peer review. And then authors are in a position to choose which journal will end up publishing their stage two registered report. So they could go to any eligible journal on this side, or they could submit to any other journal as they so wish, or they could even choose one of these journals on the right. These are our registered reports interested journals. They have different criteria to PCI registered reports. They might um, apply different um, evaluation criteria for registered reports. For example, Nature Human Behavior applies a slightly uh, more selective approach to, to choosing which questions uh, would be suitable for publication in the journal, whereas PCI registered reports focuses on scientific validity over and above zeitgeist and so on. So these journals on the right here, they don't automatically endorse the decisions of the PCI RR initiative, but they do look closely and they get access to an embargoed list of submissions and they often do make um, offers to authors. So you're turning, what we're doing is we're turning around the market a little bit and saying, rather than you as an author submitting, you know, to one journal after another and pouring all of that money into academic publishers, we can actually flip this around and do all that peer review ourselves very efficiently. Um, and um, in, in return, you can still publish in those journals in the end. In my final minute, I want to highlight a couple of unique features that we've created here also, which don't exist in the journal world. One is programmatic registered reports, um, which solve this problem of one stage one manuscript being associated with one stage two output. Uh, and that programmatic RRs are very powerful. So, you know, great for an early career researcher or a research fellow with a program of work in front of them. And they submit one manuscript with multiple stage two arms that goes through stage one review. And then it's really simple and straightforward to publish those outputs all through one integrated review process. And perhaps the biggest selling point and our most popular track of all is what we call scheduled review. So to save the time of stage one review, we parallelize key aspects of the review process. Most, what a lot of people don't under, realize about publishing is that a lot of the time of the review process is taken up by this inefficient serializing of the, of the steps. So authors you know, write this big manuscript, they submit it to a journal, then the editor has to find reviewers, which takes weeks and weeks and weeks, then they have to wait for the reviews and then there's delays to the reviewers and so on. And the whole process is very inefficient and long. If we instead, ask authors to submit a one page snapshot, like a one page pro forma, before they've even started writing their stage one manuscript, we can then line those reviewers up for the future, say six or eight weeks ahead. And then when the, re the review period comes around, those reviewers have ring fenced that time in their diary. So they know they're expecting a manuscript on this date and they're gonna submit their review seven days within that a week, one week window of that period. And the whole process is very, very fast. So we can reduce that stage one review time down simply by performing key aspects in parallel. Here's an example of how a PhD student can actually do an entire PhD using the combination of scheduled review track and programmatic registered reports using this platform. I won't go into detail on this for some time reasons, but you can find this in my slides and you can find loads of other information too. So there's on the, on the main website, we've got, we've got lots of submissions coming in. There's um, one of the great things about this initiative is that it's opening up registered reports to a range of fields that have never used them before and a range of different research methods as well. And all of it is associated with open peer review. So I'll leave it there. Um, I've already gone over my 10 minutes um, and uh, I think I may be the lucky last. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. You were the lucky last. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, all our speakers, I mean, one thing is clear, the future of peer review is multiple, uh, what an uh, array of riches we've had presented. Please uh, gather your thoughts, take a comfort break. Uh, we will be back for a panel discussion at uh, 2.30, which is in 14 minutes time. Um, so thank you, uh, audience and speakers, and we'll see you very shortly to pick up discussion of these issues. Okay, we are back. I am uh, going to um, jump right in and pick up some questions from the comments, and um, uh, we'll see where we get. So we had one from... Um, Natalie Harriman, which was uh, for Chris and his presentation on um, uh, uh, 
registered reports and peer community in registered reports. How might the peer review process affect research culture in terms of publish or perish ethos and the way academics are assessed on their metrics? Yes, thank you. Um, it's a good question. So I think um, for a start, I think metric based evaluation of researchers is something that goes beyond the peer review process. This is something that's generally done by um, institutions, for example, and you have to look at hiring policies and promotion policies. And I think that, and there's an effort, of course, at the moment in the UK toward updating these and making them more aligned with um, more progressive principles surrounding open science and whatnot. So I think at a broad level, I think it's 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 kind of agnostic on that point. But I, what I would say is there's certainly no negative impact. So for those who are worried about metrics evaluation and perhaps that using a, an initiative like the peer community in registered reports initiative might somehow downgrade their metrics or in, in some form, I wouldn't worry about that because you still end up publishing at your, if you wish in a, in a journal, just as you would before. It's just that the peer review process has been done independently of, of the journal. So it's still the same community doing the peer reviewing. Um, it's there's, if I would argue probably a higher quality because we have a, a specialized registered reports team that has written the policies and handles the submissions. Um, there are also kind of some aspects of, of the PCIRR initiative which are beneficial for, for researchers. For example, if you look at registered reports broadly, they, have, they eliminate outcome bias from the process. So to the extent that metrics might be biased by publication bias itself, so positive results might result in more metrics or you know, uh, more bias in evaluation than others. Registered reports level that playing field while still being cited the same. Um, and I think you know, when you combine that with PCI, it kind of also dispels the myth that's true, I think, of many journals. This is pervading, pervade, pervasive myth that some journals have better peer review than others even though it's the same community doing the reviewing for all these journals. It's just that for most of the journals, it's hidden away and you can't see it. Um, so, you know, to that extent also, I think it probably helps to level the playing field. So my general answer would be, if you want to fix metrics, you've got to go higher. You've got to go to evaluation policies by institutions and maybe also by funders. But also there's no real negative effects for those who are worried about metrics. Thank you, Chris. Do any of our panelists want to make a response to that specific question or what Chris has said. Okay, uh, there's a comment from Ludo Waltman here in the chat. Ludo, do you want to ask your question or shall I summarize it for you? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I would be happy to indeed uh, uh, um, ask my question. Uh, it's for you, Kim. Um, I um, I really appreciate all these analysis that, that you just showed. Um, it's really important that we understand this better, of course, this difference between uh, uh, um, single and uh, double anonymous peer review in its, uh, its effects. Um, at the same time, I personally always feel kind of uneasy when we need to do things anonymously because apparently that's the only way in which we as humans can behave uh, properly. So I keep wondering, like, is there a better way to address bias? And, and basically my question is, um, in the four schools framework, there's also this democracy and transparency idea, which um, um, uh, is kind of promoting the opposite approach. Let's make it all transparent. Uh, um, in the extreme case, reports are open, but also identities are open, everything, identities of authors and reviewers. And I still hope that we can make the argument that, that that's also a solution to bias and perhaps even a better solution. Um, because, of course, those who, who, who provide biased judgments can also be exposed. It's all visible. They can be criticized for being biased. And biases themselves can become part of actually the discussion that we are having about, about scholarly work and the way in which scholarly work is being being assessed. So I was really wondering, Tim, what, what your perspective is on, 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 on that uh, uh, approach. Thanks, Ludo. It's a really great question. And thank you also to Stephanie for answering <laughs> answering it partly in the chat. Um, so when, when we were discussing this, we, we felt we had two options. Under the single anonymous method, one part of the um, the community has power over another and what you what you want is for equity right so it either has to be everybody's anonymous or nobody's anonymous and so we were really toying between those two options and we did some outreach and some surveys and we also looked at some literature and what we found was that there was 
considerably more support for the double anonymous method and where it really made a difference was for our early community research uh, early career researchers who were really concerned about putting their name to a review that they would then be they may be criticizing somebody that might be you know helping them in their career later on they might be saying something slightly inaccurate and that they would you know be held against them forever so there was a real reticence among that early career researchers uh, group to get involved with peer review and as we've all heard about that burgeoning demand on peer reviewers these are the these are the people we cannot alienate um, and who really need to feel confident and safe and secure in providing peer reviews so that was the main contributing factor um, we really felt we'd be potentially alienating a group that we really need to be on side um, and ultimately that would have an impact for our authors because it would be really difficult for us to find reviewers and it's interesting now we offer transparent peer review and we give reviewers the option do you want to be named alongside the review or not it's about 50 percent that say yes and 50 percent that say no so there's a, there's a big demographic there who for whatever reason don't want their name associated with the review and yeah, for those reasons, we we went with double. But I agree in principle, it's a really attractive proposition. Rebecca. Yes, if I could add to that, because I think there's one other element that can, that in my mind anyway, tips the balance, because if you also do the peer review after publication, as I was sort of trying to say earlier, I think that changes the nature of what the peer review is about. So actually, you know, you're you're not stopping the potentially stopping the publication, so it becomes less of an anti antagonistic discussion, right? So it's more about supporting the author in trying to improve it. And so actually, your comments, even if you are an early career researcher, and we certainly had examples of. I mean, I, I recognise that um, for early career researchers, but we've had examples of where you know you can word those comments in a way that isn't seen as criticism, but is more in terms of you know a supportive discussion, essentially. Um, where actually you can gain real credibility in the eyes of the, the senior research and the senior authors. And we've had those kind of um, authors on Twitter afterwards, you know, saying well done, so it, but thanks for the great comments and all the rest of it. So I think, you know, I think it's also about what it is we're trying to get the peer review to do. And, and as I say, doing it after publication, I think really helps. And in addition, I think it's also on us as a broader community to change that, that, uh, culture really of you know early career researchers feeling like they can't speak up and can't criticize because that's a real fundamental problem in science um, and that we need to address. Emily. I'd like to I'd love it first of all how we're all coming at this kind of from our own perspectives but I'd like to raise a slightly different point too and that is another way that that we can work to address bias is to ensure that the demography of our board and our reviewer pools is reflective of the community that we are you know the the, the authorship community that we're drawing from and that's, it absolutely will not eliminate bias but we know that boards are not representative at all and there's been some really interesting research that's come out you know especially in, in the medical field, a, a paper recently, um, just about how skewed they actually are. And so I would look forward to concrete approaches being taken by journals and publishers to, to try to address this and see then if that kind of feeds into to different metrics, you know, Kim, that, that you look on, on down the line too. Without wanting to derail the discussion, if I can respond really briefly, if I'd had more time, I'd have loved to show you um, what we're doing in that respect as well, because that is that is part of our approach as well. Is like I mentioned at the beginning, the literature absolutely supports that the diversification of the gatekeepers is going to make a big difference, and so part of the reason we're sharing our data externally is to hold us accountable to that. And so we have um, have very robust plans and we've actually done a few trials to see what makes a difference and what doesn't in recruiting a more diverse reviewer pool, author um, editorial boards and editors in chief. Um, and it is definitely, definitely making a difference. Uh, Chris had a comment, a question for you, Kim, about uh, triple blind reviewing. Um, well, I just I'll let him ask. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I thought um, it's really interesting. I've thought a lot about triple blind reviewing too. And the thing I can't figure out is how you, if the editor doesn't know who the authors are, how do they invite 
reviewers without conflicts. In fact, you know, in my own editing, um, it's so easy to mess up even when you know who the authors, when, when you know who the authors are and, and you're inviting reviewers and, you, and you're trying to find papers that, you know, that, that you're trying to exclude reviewers who have co-authored with them in the last four years. And often it requires a lot of careful going through publication records and whatnot. How on earth do you do that if you don't know who the, the authors are? And if somebody else is doing it, are you still an editor even? Because I think a crucial part of editing is actually choosing the right reviewers in the first place. Really good question. And part of the reason why we're not doing it, to be brutally honest, because it is really complex. But part of the solution we're trying to develop, a, well, we, are, we have developed a tool in-house to help with reviewer selection. And one of the things that we're working on in one of our next releases is um, conflict of interest. Uh, so it, it will automatically exclude people from the same institution, people with an authorship history with the current co-author so that you would you would all you would not see the people with an obvious conflict of interest anyway in your suggested like your reviewer list that you might want to pick from um so I think partly there's a technological answer but the other thing that we've been thinking about how we implement this is to separate out parts of the editor role into people who need to know the identity for very good reason and people who don't need to know the identity so reviewer selection might be a very good reason for some for needing to know somebody's somebody's identity but decision making might not be so can you actually separate parts of the process out um, and in the same way involve more people in collective decision making to enable that that process to work I'm not I'm not saying I have it figured out yet but there's a few there's a few different um avenues that we'd like to try and are open to failing but but would like to try yeah that's a really good answer thank you Katie McNeil would you like to ask your question or shall I try and summarize it I'm going to take that as I'm going to summarize so, it oh no you're here <laughs> Oh, just that Emily, we were making interesting points around what you see as the role of journals in the process. And that's certainly a debate that I've seen in the fields emerging around what should be the role of journals as opposed to other actors. And I'd be interested in hearing just more thoughts on that from everyone as to what they see as sort of the unique role of journals in this process. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my view has always been that, that really journals, yeah, there's an important role, I think, for the 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 curation element. After you've done all the sort of sound science peer review, have they done this sensibly at the conclusion, sensible for you know how they've approached it, etc. There is a need for some element of curation um beyond that. Uh, and so I think ultimately our view is that's that's where there's a one of the areas where there's a real uh, value, I think, that, uh, that journals are well set up to do that curation process. And if you separate that from the peer review and the publication and all of those elements, you remove a lot of the current issues in having those elements combined. The other aspect, though, and whether it's journals or elsewhere, but currently that's where the expertise is broadly sitting, is, I think, in some of those checks that I was trying to to sort of flag earlier, I think with the increasing problem we have around integrity, particularly um, in research and what's being published, and, and I think an increasing crisis around that really, um, there is real expertise that is needed and that um, currently sits with in publishers primarily around those kind of checks to spot paper mills, to spot authorship issues, to spot all sorts of things that are happening in uh, publishing more broadly. And that is critical. I think if we, if we don't have that as well, because peer reviewers are not going to spot this and they, they're not going to see the volume to be able to spot these kind of issues um, or have the expertise. We don't have that element as well. We don't recognise how important that is then I think we're going to continue to get or we'll get into an even worse position in terms of being able to really trust the research that's been published more broadly. Um, so uh, there was a question much earlier in the chat, uh, which uh, from Roberto saying, isn't one of the main issues time? Any of the proposed fixes to peer review essentially boil down to even more work, um, and which is basically volunteer work. And uh, 
Dan Major Smith has just asked in the chat, should peer reviewers be paid and would that help fix the system even to a small extent? Would anyone like to pick that up? I'm happy to have a shot at that one. Chris. Um, uh, I, I think it's really interesting. I, I would like reviewers to be paid, but I would prefer if they're not paid by profiteering publishers, because I think that would solidify the control of companies like Elsevier and Wiley and whatnot in uh, uh, dominating the management of peer review. And I think we should be looking beyond that, because I, actually I think we should be trying to regain as much control of the review process as possible within the community and keep it within the community. That said, it'd be really nice to be able to pay reviewers within models like the Peer Community and Registered Reports Initiative. The challenge is, how do you fund it? Because nobody's getting paid, right? So if you take Peer Community in, um, the recommenders aren't getting paid, the reviewers aren't getting paid, the authors don't pay, readers don't pay because it's all preprints. Everything is free. And what the way it's funded at the moment is through um, uh, philanthropy, charity donations, library fee. Like there's a whole distributed funding model from... European libraries giving a small amount and, and it's enough to keep everything going. In fact, you can run. It's amazing how little money you need to run a really high quality evaluation platform. Um, but there's still not enough there to really pay reviewers. And I think if we could pay reviewers, if we could find a way to fund that, for instance, through building up a capital base um, through, through philanthropic donations, the, one of the big advan advantages of that is it would open up reviewing to groups that don't often consider it within their capabilities to do it. So marginalized groups, Global South, um, people outside academia who still review, uh, provide very high quality evaluations in my experience, but of course are not, have no, they have no skin in the game. So it's, they're not part of the quid pro quo of the academic system. I think it would certainly help to make peer review more inclusive and broader and better if we could come up with a paid model. But I re really hope that it's not um, academic publishers who are doing the paying because I think that would actually cement their control over the process even more. That's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, we've got a hand up from Roberto and uh, then uh, Emily after that. Hi, um, thanks Thanks for your answer. Um, I just uh, wanna elaborate more, like my question was not really about, I mean, yes, that's being paid is one way to address what I'm saying. But it's more. I don't. I don't see that as a necessarily as a, it may be just a token gesture. I mean, just something that recognizes the work of the reviewer. Uh, because I don't see the institutions giving you any credit. They barely give you credit for how many papers you publish. I can see. I don't see them giving credit for how many papers you're going to review. Um, so some, and 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 it's not. I I don't necessarily agree with the fact that nobody's paying for this because when I submit a paper, I pay quite a bit of uh, charges. Uh, a paper can be like a thousand pounds for a twenty pages paper, even on an open access platform. And sometimes open access is even more expensive. So this money must go somewhere. Um. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't have a solution, but I have the feeling that everything that we discussed so far is is um, the bottom line is that there are more and more journals, more and more papers, and the same amount of reviewers and editors, and uh, and the same amount of time. <laughs> um, Thank you. Emily, do you want to pick up on that and Chris's That's comments before? Exactly what I wanted to do. Yes, thanks. So I think you, Roberta, you just hit on a really important part of this, which is it's not necessarily about payment per se, but it's about properly rewarding people's work, people who are in, you know, at all aspects of the review process from editors to reviewers and, and, and all of the important contributions that they make. I am not convinced that, that a payment is necessarily the right way forward. I think it opens a lot of questions about, you know, do we have minimum standards for quality? Um, how, you know, for, for high volume journals such as such as mine, um, it would 
<laughs> just to, it would give me a nightmare to think about, you know, implementing the sort of system we get over 100 submissions every single day. And so keeping track of all of that and making those payments, you know, we just, we, we don't, we don't, we don't have resources for that. It would make publishing a lot more expensive and we don't want to pass those costs on. But also there were, you know, there have been uh, attempts to make the reviewing process kind of more professional, right? There was a fast track experiment that was run with a board of reviewers and people, authors paid a little bit more to access this fast track. This is Springer Nature a couple of years ago. And it just makes it more exclusive. And so I think we as a community need to come together and understand what can we do to show the appreciation for all of the work that goes in, which is not appropriately rewarded. It's not appropriately incentivized right now. And I think that some of the conversations about aut automization too can help with the time crunch that you mentioned of, make it easy for people to review. If we're just looking for a stats review, pull that stats out, you know, make sure, put, put different tools to the test to make sure that, you know, aspects of the data analysis, that the statistical tests are, are appropriate. Um, so where we can automate, where we can bring technology to play, we, we are. And so we're relying on reviewers to access only the things that actually require their specialized brains. Thank you. If I can just, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your comment. If, if I can just add one thing, uh, somebody earlier said something about uh, a journal doesn't necessarily, uh, well, they, they claim they do, but they don't necessarily guarantee that the re review process is better than um, than another journal. And, and this, this could also be a way to address this, like higher quality journals will have higher quality reviews if they, you know, somehow um, reward the work of these reviewers and, and the editors. This is also volunteers. I don't know, just, I, do, I don't have a solution. I'm just um, saying this seems to me the fundamental problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a question of Helen, who presented first, you remember, and I found that uh, the four schools of peer review really interesting and a really useful in this sort of like multitude of options, a really useful framework. And uh, Helen emphasized that this is kind of people's a focus of the priorities and alignment of intervention priorities rather than being exclusive categories. But what I wanted to ask you, Helen, was having heard the speakers today, do you feel like the framework holds up? Um, uh, or, or, you know, or, or is there anything that fell between the gaps or contradicted your framework? Yeah, I, um, I thought it was really interesting to hear all the different examples. And um, also, I'd like to say Ludo's here as a lead author on this uh, paper. He may want to come in. Um, so I thought it was interesting to hear all the different initiatives, and I think they um, obviously corresponded with the different with the four schools. Uh, what I found really interesting was um, how um, within the schools, so the the broad enough categories to. So we heard about initiatives where they were able to tailor. Um, what was required for their um, their community. So things work differently within um, for depending whether you're a, an ECR or a more senior researcher and we've heard where things were tailored to um, support particular communities and are not kind of um, bias against a certain community. Um, and also things work differently in different disciplines. So you know what might work with if you're dealing with um, a quantitative research might not work very well if you're doing, dealing with something theoretical or uh, with a, some qualitative research. You know, for example, if you're doing something more inductive um, and it's a kind of a, you know, a living protocol or something's going to be developed, then, you know, that's very different. Something where you can clearly state at the beginning, this is what like a, a protocol for a systematic review in health, for example, because there are very different types of research. So we've heard about way um, a num the number of different interventions now they're tailored to different kinds of knowledge and different types of um, people at different career stages so I thought that was really interesting different solutions to things so that I think the model's useful in that it's um, it's broad enough that it allows to for those kinds of things to fit within them 
um, but it's not too broad that it's you know that it's meaningless. It's just it's too high level. So I think we've um, um, hopefully hit uh, something that's useful and it's, it's worked well this discussion. So I'm grateful to be able to present on that today on behalf of the team. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, Ludo has a question. Would, would you is peer review necessary? Do you want to speak to that, Ludo? Yeah, yes, it relates to kind of this huge pressure, of course, that the peer review system is creating for all of us. And sometimes I wonder, shouldn't we just kind of uh, uh, um, acknowledge that it's kind of not feasible anymore to review all the articles in a proper way, all the articles that are, be, that are being written, um, but be really explicit about it. So be explicit about the fact that we have lots of articles that haven't really been peer reviewed. And then perhaps also, for those articles that really matter, that for instance may really have uh, um, uh, important uh, societal consequences, for instance, uh, influence the treatment of patients in, in hospitals, for those articles, really make sure we do in the peer review. So not having just two reviews for those, but having five and stop doing peer review for many other articles for which for which we cannot really afford to do it. And indeed, articles that probably are written for all kinds of questionable reasons, researchers being under pressure and all of that. Sometimes I feel that this is the only way to kind of deal with the system that we have at the moment and all the pressure it is creating. Question for all panelists. Can I answer very quickly of my own view on that? Very quick. Quickly um, is good. I think, uh, it's a really interesting argument. I'll tell you why it won't work, because the minute you do that, you, large sections of the academic community have to say, my work isn't important enough for peer review, and they'll never admit that because everyone's work is super important to themselves. And so we end up back where we started. To do that, you have to divorce peer review from quality evaluation, and that's a big road. Other panelists? Just, just one comment from me, and it's, uh integrity that's that's one of my biggest challenges there are there are things you can do as a publisher to spot integrity issues but there are also things that only a subject expert would spot um and so for that reason i got a bit of a sick feeling in my stomach when this started to be discussed um i, I love that i love the concept but uh, yeah i i can see a number of pitfalls sadly Rebecca, I think you'll be our final comment for the afternoon. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I broadly agree what, with what Lizzie is saying. I guess the question is whether it's, it goes back to the point of peer review being seen as one thing, right? I mean, I think there are some checks that can be done, whether we call it peer review or don't, we can decide. But there are probably different community that could do some important checks on the small incremental findings that will give us that, that level. And I completely agree. I think trying to do full blown peer review on everything doesn't make any sense. So we've got to be, I think, much more nuanced around it. Thank you. We are at the end of our scheduled time and it is uh, part of my honor always to finish on scheduled time. So thank you to all our panelists. Thank you audience for your attention. Thank you, Yukaren and Rory and Will, particularly behind the scenes. Um, uh, like all good uh, panels, I feel like we were just getting started with the discussion and now we have to stop. But thank you all and um, have good afternoons. <laughs>